Martin joined the Border Cathedral Group as Marketing and Creative Director in June 2011 and he uh, was, a, was a consultant for Cathedral for 12 years running up to that. Um, Cathedral, for those of you who don't know, are sort of leading mixed, re mixed use and regeneration specialists, so taking kind of buildings in, in sort of tired, run-down areas of, of London and the South East and really sort of transforming them and sort of making new places to, for people to live and work. So a sort of fantastic um, emissary from that world to sort of talk us through that question of, as I say, what do developers want from, from designers and architects. Um, Martin's got a sort of presentation that will take about five or ten minutes. Um, I think that's sort of eight things he's learned in his time at, at Cathedral um, and some pretty sort of uh, pugnacious stuff in there, hopefully. Um, and then we'll be sort of having a chat afterwards. I'll, so, I'll sort of start off with some questions for Martin and then hopefully you guys can dive in and, and sort of do my work for me and, and ask as many questions as possible. So do sort of think those up as, uh, as Martin's talking. But without further ado, over, over to Martin. Thanks, Mike. Um, can I just do a bit of a show of hands? Who's in the audience? Architects? Oh, good. Uh, designers, interior designers? Oh, lots. Developers? One, hello. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> okay, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Martin Evans. Um, I'm the creative director at Cathedral Group. Um, I'm a property developer, and I spend a large part of my life working with architects. Um, that's my job. Uh, it's a slightly unusual job in a property development company. Uh, not the fact that I spend a lot of my time working with architects, but that I understand them and can, for some time at least, speak the same language as them. Um, believe me, it's an unusual thing. Uh, in my long experience of working in a wide range of industries, I've never come across a situation where two of the most crucial collaborators in any given project can exhibit such a complete lack of understanding and sympathy on both sides. I'm not blaming either side one more than another. It cuts both ways. It's pretty common among the developers uh, that I meet for them to characterize architects as a necessary evil and those that cost more than others as nothing more than having a laugh. Uh, I'm not joking about that. Many architects see in their developer clients, perhaps not surprisingly in this case, um, as ignorant philistines, value engineering the quality out of everything and failing to see the value in good design. Many times, in my experience, both sides have a point. I'm proud and lucky, though, to say that my company is relatively enlightened in this regard. We have a series of very vibrant relationships with our architects and uh, our designers, and our schemes could certainly not achieve what they do without very close collaboration with the design teams that we work with, who we put at the very centre of our development process. Um, I've learned some lessons along the way, some of them very hard learned, particularly with the brutal funding landscape of the last five years, so I thought I'd share some of them with you this afternoon. So this is my first lesson, no one else is going to save us. Um, I'll say it now and I'll get it over with simply and clearly, basically we're fucked. Our public finances are in the toilet and they aren't coming out anytime soon. We have town centres in terrible distress, industrial development has judded to a complete halt and house building is a trickle of what it needs to be. Plenty of cranes over central London building grade A commercial space at the minute, but that alone isn't going to save us. So what's to do? Well people, it's up to us. Unless we private sector developers, architects and designers work together to create schemes that regenerate town centres, create economic and social growth and provide new public services, it's all over. Because the public sector isn't going to do it. So we have to be clever. We have to leverage the very best in joined up thinking we can to deliver high value schemes on public land, mixed in use, provide public facilities from the profits of private speculative development and create the great private and social housing that we need. It's at the nexus of clever financial and planning strategies and great design that will make these schemes possible. And that isn't going to happen unless architects and developers really get round a table and to stand each other and the economic need and work together to produce something special. This is our scheme in Clapham High Street. It's just completed. Uh, it's uh, two buildings on two sites, built on uh, public land uh, in a partnership with Lambeth Council. Here on the uh, eastern side of Clapham High Street is the library building. It's got at the ground floor, basement and first floor a new library for, uh, for Lambeth and for Clapham Town Centre. Uh, next door to it, a doctor's surgery and above it, 134 flats. Uh, this is what it looks like inside, designed by architects called Studio Agro West and we are particularly proud of it. Uh, it just uh, won its 12th award from Mike's magazine over there, uh, Best Development of the Year for the library building, which we're particularly proud of. Um, this is the library. 
And then over the road, a new leisure centre built on the site of an, an old uh, Victorian swimming baths that was crumbling and failing. Both of those sites had buildings on them. Uh, both of those buildings were failing, costing the local authority unbelievably large amounts of money to maintain, but on valuable public land that otherwise was just sitting to dull, unused buildings. So we took that land into a partnership with the local authority. We planned a new library and a new leisure centre, and we built those and gave them back to the council at zero cost to the public purse, all paid for by the speculative development around them of the private uh, residential, the doctor's surgery and the social housing. Uh, Four-court sports hall, a new gym, paid for by this uh, housing. Well, these are the nicer ones on the top. We just sold the last one last week, so we're done and finished with this building now. Uh, Lambeth Council don't allow any uh, parking permits on new builds in Clapham Town Centre. So uh, we gave everybody that bought a flat a uh, bike and uh, this bike is tied into the lease of the building. So when you sell your flat, you have to give the bike along with it. Uh, so, number two, understand your client. And this is I say this to the architects in the room. The most productive relationships I have with architects is when I can truly say that my designers understand what I need. Times are tough at the minute. So now is not a time for arrogance or sticking rigidly to principles that are just not appropriate for these crazy financial times. However, when great, great design can pull a financially stretched scheme out of the doldrums and solve its problems, which I truly believe that it can, then that is the time to be more passionate about your skills than you've ever been before. Just make sure that you connect the two things. Developers have to understand that design adds value and that you are the ones that are going to deliver it. So you need to show them how your work can make an average scheme, delivering average risky levels of profit, sing from the rooftops, and deliver above average returns. We all know that it's completely possible, and you know how to do it. I want my architects to talk my language, to understand that costs are screamingly tight, to understand that I have to pack more density onto a site than any I've ever done before, and I have to get it through planning without having to go to appeal, first time. Only great design can achieve that. So I want my architects to inspire me, to lead me, and to teach me. Uh, this is a scheme that we're currently uh, building in Brighton. Um, it's the Red Line building down there, just uh, across the road from the Royal Pavilion. It's two acres. It's an old market building that's designed by the same architect as Spitalfields. It's not as nice a building as Spitalfields, but it's, uh, it's been empty for a long time. Uh, have I got a... I have got a pointer, sorry. So just to the south of that, higher up the picture, is the University of Brighton's uh, Arts Faculty. Just to the left of it is some of the worst, most deprived social housing in Brighton. And then going off the picture to the left, it gets even worse. Uh, it's a grim place, but look how close it is to the Royal Pavilion and to Valley Gardens that runs down the centre into Brighton and the lanes and the cool bit of the town centre that are just 500 yards away across the street. So we have an opportunity here to build something really special that changes that place. But it's low land value at the minute. To get the massing on that site, we worked with an architect four or five years ago before the crash happened. Uh, very, very hard, and we didn't achieve it. So when things started getting a little better, this scheme came off the shelf, back onto the, the roster. We went out to a competition. We pitched to four architects to come and pitch to do this work, and we set them a challenge. Get us the mass, get us the volume of property on this site that we need, and we didn't think that they could do it, and we'd have to leave this scheme and go do something else. But they did. Not only did they do it through great design, they did it in a very Brighton way, because we told them there's no way in Brighton you can put 17-storey towers on this site. It has to look like Brighton. Look what's around it. Nothing very at all. Here's the model that they pitched uh, for their uh, competition. It's a Liverpool-based practice called Shed KM. Uh, we said, show us low-rise buildings. Uh, we said, you won't be able to do it, but show us if you can. And they did. And they produced an amazing scheme. And they produced an amazing scheme through very, very, very hard work and very, very clever design. So it can happen. Oh, and here's a CGI of what it's going to look like when it's done. So number three, do it on the first date every time. I spend a lot of my time walking around potential development sites either dead town centres, ex-industrial sites, or miserable places that you really wouldn't want to be on a rainy Monday afternoon after dark. I have a constant companion on those trips, an architect. I'm never without one. I'm constantly amazed at how similar final schemes that we produce for planning applications look to the scribble sketch that the architect produced in the cafe that rainy Monday evening. 
I'd never dream of even walking a site without an architect to bounce ideas off, discuss possibilities, uses, connections, and context. We have very close symbiotic relationships with our architects right from the start of a scheme. We definitely do it on first date. So my advice here is developers, don't move without an architect. Architects, offer your services. Give that developer a day or two free. Show you bother, get in at the beginning. We've never given a job to an architect other than the one who walked the site with us on that first rainy day. So it's money and time well spent. Next, take risks. Our greatest exposure cash-wise is at the front end of our development process, right now. Securing consent for our development activity. Very often, this is the stage before we secure debt finance, so we're investing our own cash, often exceeding one or two million pounds per project. That our architects understand this process is absolutely critical. It's a hard thing to say, particularly in this climate, but I make no apology for it. To the architects in this room, I beg you, understand this risk profile and work out how far you can share in it. Be flexible as much as you can. Do a deal with your client. Offer to work on lower fees for an increased fee or a bonus structure on planning consent or when funding kicks in. It's not ideal and I wish I didn't have to say it, but I'm afraid it's a cold fact of life in the current development climate. We're existing day to day in this business right now. None of us is awash with money. We know that the only way we're going to make anything happen is to assume risk. Risk that in easier times would be unthinkable at the minute, I have to say. But we have no choice if we want to see this economy out the other side. And it's a risk we all have to share. Some are obviously more capable of doing it than others, but I promise you, you will see the rewards. Ooh, what did I do? Okay, next, it takes two. This is about understanding relationships both ways. So where we're building, we're promoting change, sometimes radical change. And to do this, we need a unique blend of skills from our designers. I ask our architects to be storytellers, charmers and disarmers with a glint in their eye. We spend an awful lot of time listening to and drinking tea with people who are going to live and work in the places that we build. They may be the thorns in the side of a smooth planning process, but to patronise them with slick lip service PR campaigns not only never works, it simply doesn't produce the best developments. Those people deserve the full and total attention of everybody involved in the process, including the designer, the developer and all the key people in the development team. In the front row of this charge, our architect needs to be a diplomat, a genius technician, and a caring agent of social change. It's a rare mix, but the most successful schemes come when the architects and developers together tackle the communication process that smooths the scheme to planning. Uh, this is Deptford High Street in South East London. Uh, we bought a site again five or six years ago before it all went horribly wrong. This is the red line site there. It's next to Deptford High Street train station. Um, it was a pretty grim place. That's the shop that was next to the gateway into our site. It was a butcher's shop. It went out of business about a week after we bought the site. That's what it looked like inside. It was an old Victorian carriage ramp uh, that built in 1836 going up to the elevated train line. Listed structure in a terrible state of affairs. And they had been um, car workshops underneath previously. So we needed to do something about it. So together with our architects, we bought that. We shipped it down the high street one night in early February. And we knocked the shops down, parked it up, and we designed it into that, which uh, now sits like that instead of that red shop poking out into the high street. It's a cafe where you can collect your coffee on the way to work in the morning, uh, where you can sit outside in the sunshine or inside if it's raining, and there's some people proving that you can enjoy it. The arches we uh, cleared out, and the architects went and did a quick scheme, put some lighting and electricity in there. And we rented them out to those people. Local creatives, they're called, I think. Uh, they pimp cars and uh, make furniture and artists and creatives. Uh, they wanted to move out of their little garret studios into a ground floor place where they could engage with the public. So together they came to make projects to encourage people to come to see them. Um, and we funded and helped those projects along together with the architects. So we designed and built a cinema. So uh, there's them putting together and erecting a screen. Um, the chairs that you can see down there were shipping pallets cut in half and folded up to make armchairs. And then there's two ladies on site who recycle textiles into home furnishings. And so they made cushions and blankets. And together we made a cinema in a grubby, gritty part of southeast London. We made a really beautiful little place that our architects were integrally involved in. 3,000 people came and paid £10 to watch a film in a shithole in southeast London that looked pretty and lovely and warm and great. There was popcorn. 
uh, you watched the films on um, headphones uh, so that you didn't hear the ambient noise around you. Uh, and there's a terrible picture I took on my phone of them watching the film and the lady selling the popcorn. Jamie Oliver came because it was cool. And when he came, he decided he wanted to come back and make a film. So this is him with his film crew cooking in my train carriage. Uh, we repaint the train. Uh, so we have a little panel along with the architects. We choose artists and every two or three months we repaint it and uh, gets in the paper every time we repaint it. Um, and there is the building uh, that we're going to put on the site in the long term. It's designed by Richard Rogers and Roger Stoke Harbour. Um, and what I wanted to say about that in talking about the architects and developers working together is that the architects were integrally involved in that process. They had their design team meetings in the train carriage and so you can see uh, that the scheme they produced, if only the colours that they used, you can't say that that wasn't inspired in some way by what the designers had done on the train carriage. Um, being on site, having meetings, talking to the people who live and work around there. We had the longest, deepest public consultation exercise we've ever done. And our architects got so much out of being involved in that whole process. So, number five, I'm nearly done. Speak the same language. In the middle of last year, I did an interview in BD magazine. Um, I told the journalists we were busy and that we were always looking for great new architects. Oh dear, big mistake. Can you imagine the number of packages that landed on my desk over the next week or two? Uh, so we decided to go on a mission to meet as many of those people as we could because I figured if all those people had spent the time sending me things, I had to be nice in return and go see them. So I did. So uh, I tried to find a presentation, and I failed this morning, I'm afraid, uh, of some of the presentations that I was given uh, during that uh, mission to go and meet those architects. I have never seen a more woeful and terrible bunch of presentations ever in my entire life. Uh, I sat in one uh, presentation where an architect spoke like this at me, and when he spoke like this at me, he showed up on the, ski, on the screen a plan with the, a, a scale plan with the company name down in the bottom right hand side, the most technical thing up on a screen about a quarter of the size of this, and I watched everybody in the room go, this. Next slide came on was a picture of a model of a town with the scheme not represented in any way in the town. And he said, this is our scheme in Liverpool. Click onto the next thing. And it got worse from there. That was a particularly terrible one, but it was not uncommon. And I think my point about that is that when you make presentations to property developers as designers, Think about who your audience is and show them what they want to see, not what you want to tell them. That's really something that I feel particularly strong about. And I got the guy to come back and I said to him, you know, I liked you and I like your work, but your presentation was absolutely dreadful. Would you mind if you came in and we had to spend some time together and I'll tell you why? And we had a really good time and a very nice meeting. And in fact, we might give them some work. So it kind of worked in the end. Next thing, stick to what you know. Um, I can't tell the number of architects who come to can't tell you the number of architects who come to see me in this process who have no idea who we are and what we do. Uh, they present house conversions, and when I said, "Well, it's more master planners and mixed use regeneration specialists that we are looking for," they'd say, "Oh, we can do that too. We just haven't yet." It's not for me. Sorry. Uh, you want to move from doing domestic conversions to being regeneration master planners, but no one will give you a chance. I say, never mind. Do it anyway. Do a project off your own bat. Then show me that. Talk to me about your ideas while show me something that you've done. Don't come and say, this is what I do, but we can also do all that. Uh, my next question, what's in there? Um, we are regeneration developers. We're turning places around 180 degrees. That's hard. We can't just design some lovely buildings, make a nice glossy brochure and beat back the crowds who come running. We have to be innovative, clever, think about what our buildings need to be in order to make the site work. And then often we have to start that process ourselves. This is the old vinyl factory in Hayes. It's EMI's old record pressing plant. It's about 15 minutes west of Paddington. Um, it's 17 acres in the middle of a town with an enormous amount of problems, many caused by that business moving out in the early 1980s. Our single promise to Hillingdon Council, along with our planning application, was that we would bring 4,000 jobs back to that site, which is dead as a dodo at the minute. And so that was the brief we gave our architects. Help us create 4,000 jobs. The mix of uses, the master planning, the ideas for uses for specific buildings, all inspired by design team meetings and collaborative working between us and our team of designers. 
We're just applying for a £10 million loan facility from the GLA to build a turbocharged business incubation centre that will have an investment fund attached to it in one of the buildings to support new business startups and produce jobs. Again, that project is a collaboration between us and our architects. So it's as much about what goes on inside the building and around it as it is about creating the building and what it looks like from the outside. Um, I've got lots of slides on this and I'm going to flick through it because I know I'm yabbing on a lot. Ooh, sorry. Boom, boom. Okay, last one, light fires. So the last thing I would say, and probably the most important is, if you think we're not talking the same language, you architects, teach me, inspire me. Take me to see schemes you like. Show me why I should like them. Help me to understand how you think and push me to think differently. I think our role in the developer designer relationship is our sorry our role in the developer designer relationship is to light fires and then let our hugely talented design teams turn them into raging infernos. We're really happy to let that fire race off in unexpected directions for a while because once it's enthused we want to nurture our designers giving them the freedom to discover something fresh and giving them the opportunity to inspire us. So, developers, developer, my message to you, fuel those fires. And if they aren't lit, strike a match. There are enough smart people in development teams and companies all over the country to bring reality checks to the complex projects that we're engaged in. At the start of a design process, when that brief is quivering in the middle of a table, I'm not interested in a design team that wants to talk about regulations, what can't be done, and the limits of the site. I want designers with fire in their bellies who will challenge, inspire, and bring passion to my projects. Only then, when we have the ideas, comes the time to shape them and turn them into commercially sound developments. So. In conclusion, phew. What do I want the architects we work with to bring to our relationships? Number one, a huge and exciting view of the world alongside an intricate, un intricate understanding of the very essence of everyday life and essentially what contributes to community. Two, I want them to feel and understand the grain and history of the place within which our proposals nestle and to produce designs that live there. What we don't want is more of the same. However impressive the design, the huge view of the world that we ask for should inform an energetic and relevant design response specifically for the place where it lives. We want our designers to travel the world with a very light footstep and to have a real sense of adventure, but they also need to be completely marinated in technical experience and have the ambition to deliver the most progressive, sustainable developments within clear budgets, budgets that are right for the place where they will sit. Is that a tall order? Yes. But I'm not going to apologise for that, because if it wasn't a tall order, everybody would be doing it. And I'm very glad for my business that everyone we work with, that they aren't. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Martin. Some really inspirational stuff in there. Um, as I say, everyone, do think, uh, think of some questions for, for Martin as, as we go on. But I'll, I'll sort of kick us off. Um, as I say, I'm the sort of the pinstripe representative of the, the developer community. Sort of, how, how much um, of your time is sort of spent arguing with, with that side of, the, of your business on things like cost and, and sort of the, the budgetary side of things? Too much. Is it working? Yeah, too much. But um, I don't worry about that because um, I work for a very enlightened developer. Uh, and if I have to do it in my company, imagine how it is in other companies. Um, we are in the business of making money. Uh, we're in the business of making money in an incredibly, incredibly difficult economic environment at the minute. And so I am not going to apologize one second for any of my colleagues whose interest is purely at the bottom line about saying how do we get this development over the line with <coughs> as much mitigated risk as possible and with as much profit as possible. I make no apology for that. What I see my job as, as much internally as externally, is to uh, teach, encourage, and inspire my colleagues to understand that good design is one of the most very valuable tools that they can employ to mitigate the risk of that project. Um, that scheme in Clapham, uh, in 2007, when we started it, the market was soaring right above the trees. In 2012, when we delivered it, it was right down the bottom in the toilet. Um, but we got out of it, we got out of that project with above average profits because the design of that building was amazing. And the designers that we work with did the most amazing, fantastic job. And they have the awards to prove it. Um, and so we have proof in our company now. So it just got a little bit easier since that project. So, so how do you sort of quantify that it was design that kind of fed through to that kind of increased sort of financial performance? You can't. Um, it's a little bit of a belief system. So 
uh, I spend my time when I'm not working with designers in rooms with agents and accountants and quantity surveyors. So imagine how joyful that part of my life is. Um, when they tell me the most you're ever going to get for this scheme is £550 a square foot, and when I deliver some flats in that building at £850 a square foot, then it's got to be something that's not on any bit of paper that they've got that tells me why I got £850 a square foot. And I can't prove it, but I'm going to stand up in a room and I'm going to bang the table and argue for it till the cows come home because I can see no other reason why, other than the fact that that's a beautiful building and people wanted to queue up to live in it, I can see no other reason other than that it was beautifully designed. And in, you talked earlier about kind of um, the design architecture community sort of sharing the upfront risk risk with you guys. What, can you explain a bit more about what you mean yes. by that and, um, and what they get in return for kind of yes. that I, risk? Yes, I think I said I'm not going to apologise for that because I know that that might be slightly controversial but um, we are property developers five or six years ago I wouldn't have dared say that because we were awash with money and we had fees to pay for my company to invest up to a million pounds at in, 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 unbelievably high risk in projects that might just absolutely go nowhere because we can't get planning, because we can't get funding. You know, you can't get a pound of funding until you get your planning. So first off, you have to get your, through your planning. That's hard enough. Then when you get through your planning, it's another year before you get your funding. All of that cost is just pouring out of the bank. Incredibly risky. We are, excuse me, I'm just going to think. We're not a hedge fund. We're not a um, pension fund with a, loads of money in the bank. We're an entrepreneurial property development company. The vast majority of the costs of that million pounds are in uh, fees to professional uh, partners who do the work for us. So predominantly the architects, but planning consultants and M&E engineers and quantity surveyors. I just talked about that because for us to constantly have to, you know, we don't have to do this. We can sit on the property that we have, we can take our income from it. If we're going to do anything and sort this situation out in our economy, and if we're going to try to make some money, we have to take risk. And all I uh, beg of people is just to understand that and to see whether there is any way in which they might also be able, in a small way, to contribute to that risk. And all I mean in terms of the, uh, the professionals who take fees from us for great work during that process is I am very, very happy to sit with my architects and have conversations about deferral of some or part or all of the fees until risk is less for a considerable upswing in those fees or for a l larger than average success bonus or for if it was a bigger deal than that for maybe some part in the risk profile of the profit. Um, I, I think what I mean is our conversations, our door is open, our conversations are open to those kind of things and uh, we will get things done quicker and better and easier for all of our benefits if we work together and have some go at sharing that risk. And, and how sort of amenable are the people sat on the other side of the table to that, to that proposition and has, well, that, has that changed recently? Well, it's why I said in my um, speech, it's not for everybody, you know, where there are small practices like Shed KM who are working with us in Brighton, they couldn't possibly defer any of their fees for uh, their work because they're a small practice. They have to pay wages of the people who are doing the work. So I have absolutely no beef with that. But when they are larger practices that maybe have a lot of work in Doha, uh, they're getting super duper fees and they're paying on time. Maybe there's room there for a bit of flexibility. That's all I'm suggesting, flexibility. Do people in Doha actually pay any fees? I thought that was a sticky issue for the design community. Um, as far as I know, they do. In, in terms of um, the schemes that, as you say, sort of large mixed-use schemes, um, how, how do you, again, sort of quantify the benefits of, of getting involved in sort of public realm and, and does the sort of design community kind of share the vision of, you know, it needs to be around the building as well as, as, well as the building itself? Um, we build in difficult places that are not very nice and our job is to turn them into lovely places where people want to live and work and entertain themselves. The better the design of those places, of the buildings and what's around them and the landscaping in the public realm, the nicer those places are for people to live. Um, we're building in Canning Town at the minute. Next door to us is a housing scheme from a large house builder who I won't mention. Uh, and what they've done in their housing scheme is so typical. They have uh, built a huge scheme, 200-odd flats. 
the planners required that they had some kind of commercial or ground floor active uses around the building um, because it's a wasteland where those uh, houses are in Canning Town where those flats are. Those uh, developers, they don't understand how to work with good architects. They're not interested in doing anything outside of the very narrow focus that their house building takes them. And so they're required to market those ground floor uses to retailers. And so they take a tiny little ad out in the local paper. And they go to the council and say, mm, we tried really hard. Uh, and the council say, oh, never mind. Go on, you can have flats on the ground floor. And they say, oh, thanks. And off they go and build flats. And then they just make these buildings that are flats from top to bottom that are just tumbleweeds roll past the front door. Uh, terrible, horrible places. So when you look at that and you see what could, could happen if great designers were allowed to work with good developers to turn the ground floor and the surrounding areas of those developments into beautiful, lovely places that might attract the kind of, not retailers because those are not high footfall places, but businesses that have some retail element about them that might, be, uh, that might attract some footfall. And if you bother and care about it and provide them a nice place to be, it will work. And, and do sort of local authorities get the, the design and commercial imperative uh, at, at the moment? Because obviously they're the kind of keys to the, to the kingdom in terms of the ownership of the, of the land, etc. Depends where it is. <laughs> Depends where it is. We work with good, or good local authorities and terribly bad ones. Um, and I would say in London they're in about equal measure. What, what, are, the good, what are the good ones do well and what do the bad ones do badly? The good ones are tough. Uh, they employ clever people, clever planners, um, clever regeneration experts who understand, who know the landscape of that uh, in industry and issues and place huge demands on developers and architects working with them, going through the planning system and they don't back down. Where they're smart, where they understand viability, uh, they know they need not back down. Um, it's the ones who just want a cheap political... Um, gesture to happen that are the problem where they see a big problem of housing and they just say chuck it up uh, that's where there's a problem so it's where politics where politics um, uh, clashes with clever people officers and clever experts inside the councils that's where it becomes a problem and and what can your kind of designers and architects do to help you in those sort of conversations where they are sort of tough either with a a good local authority that knows what it wants or one of the sort of more intransigent well, ones? Well, typically um, our architects, the larger ones especially, so Roger Stoke Harbour for instance, are working on projects all over the world. Many, many more projects than we've ever done. And so to take those architects into a planning, into meeting with the planners and the councillors and talk about success of schemes in other places and how they've worked, talk authoritatively with, with uh, experience of how those things have worked, there's nothing better than that. It's, that's, that's what persuades people, passion and experience. Sure. Um, in, in terms of, you know, kind of using, using design and making it kind of pay financially, is that something that's only really viable in sort of London and the South East at the moment? Because obviously, you know, that's where the market is, is sort of doing particularly well. Um, we don't develop outside of London and the South East, so I don't have an awful lot of experience to bring to that. But I can't believe that that's true. Uh, good design uh, works everywhere. It, it, good design... Good design isn't a thing. Good design is about making good places work. It's about mixing viability with beauty, with passion, with excitement and inspiration. It's about making a good place, making a place work. It's not making a place beautiful, it's making a place work. Part of that working is that it's beautiful and inspiring and lovely place to be, but the most important thing is that it works. And why, why is there anywhere in the world where that isn't gonna work? Sure. And, and in terms of London, obviously a lot of that market is being driven by kind of overseas investment at the moment, be it, you know, the kind of Chinese investor buying the flat off plan in, in Battersea Power Station or, or, or anywhere across London. Has, has that changed the way you guys look at yes. design and, and how you sort of market and that kind of thing? Yes, definitely. Um, every developer that it builds a single flat at the minute is looking at private rental sector and not uh, selling flats to people, um, to, to occupiers, I mean. Uh, selling, yes, but to uh, rental companies or rental investors to rent. And so that changes uh, how you look at the market. We, we in this country are going to have a transformation over the coming few years in terms of our approach to buying or renting flats. Um, no longer, very soon, no longer is renting a flat going to be seen as the second best option to buying. 
If that's the case, then house builders need to think about what that means in terms of what they need to provide in those units. Who is renting? Why? For how long? What do they need in those flats that's different from maybe somebody buying it and living in it for two years and staircasing up. Um, perversely, it means that people will stay in flats longer than they would if they particularly smaller starter flats than they would if they bought because there's no impetus to sell and move on and move up. So um, it has a significant impact on what we do, yes. And, and are you sort of developing yet purely for the kind of the private rent, rented sector? And Part of what we do, yes. And, and does that international context make a difference? As I say, you know, you can get the kind of the high no. pound per square foot if you sell in Kuala Lumpur or Hong Kong, Singapore. No, I don't think so. I, I think I think that's about um, efficiency. Uh, you need to show a, a buyer in a foreign country who is hardly ever going to come and see the property that they own in London needs to understand that they've got a property that will rent quickly and be durable and efficient and liked by the market. So yes, you're designing for a buyer in a foreign country, but you're really buying for the person in London who's going to rent the flat and pay the rent to the person in the foreign country. Sure. Um, any any questions for Martin at all from the from the floor? We've got a sort of roving microphone, so just. Uh Put your hand up, say who you are. Over there. Um, yeah, my, my name is Michael Holmes Coates. I'm from the Architects Trolley. Hello. Um, I'm noticing in conversations that architects have when developers aren't around, one of the things, particularly when we're talking with, say, social housing clients, one of the things that we're interested in is developers being in for a bit of a longer term than the, the quick in and out. It's never that quick. But So what's your response to that, or is that already part of what Cathedral are doing? Yes. Um, we are frustrated that uh, the typical model that we might follow is that we sell all our flats in that building there, for instance, and then we might dispose of the freehold to uh, an investment fund. Um, that frustrates us because, one, commercially it doesn't allow us to take any part in the upswing of value of that building, which is going to only do that over the next 10 years, and somebody else is getting the benefit of that. Um, also, it doesn't allow us to control our sites. You know, we spend an awful lot of time worrying about how they're going to be and what they're going to look like and what they're going to be like, and then the minute they're finished, we're off. Uh, that's not good. So um, we are developing uh, a way now that we might be able to hold the sites, both the resi for PRS model and the sites for uh, estate management, if you like, to keep. So we are particularly interested in that. Uh, the lady in the front right there, I think, had a question as well. Uh, thanks. I'm Lily Bernheimer from Spaceforce Consulting. And I was wondering, with some of the issues you were discussing at the end there around um, the rise of private renting, what kinds of issues, what factors are you finding are going to be really important in considering this becoming a much larger part of the housing market and something, you know, not just that young urban professionals will live in for a few years, but that can go on to have families? So the people who are going to be forced out of buying flats uh, into renting because they can't get a mortgage, um, not just first-time buyers. Um, apparently, I'm suffering from second buyer syndrome, which is that you want to move up to a larger flat. You haven't got enough equity in your small first-time buyer flat to get a decent mortgage, and so you're stuck with a salary that could afford the mortgage that you want, but the, an inability to get a good rate to get one. It's a very common problem at the minute. Those people who are being uh, pushed into rental sector spend 40 or 50 pounds a month on a mobile phone from O2 and Apple, where they get the most amazing service. They get their product marketed to them in an amazing way. They get the most amazing service. They spend two or 300 pounds on their car a month. Amazing product, amazing service. They go on holiday. They stay in hotels. Amazing product, amazing service. Then they go to rent a flat, and they go to the Black Cats Rental Agency in Camden, and they say, those 17 flats that are in your window, could I see them all? And the man says, I'm sorry, they went at 9 o'clock this morning. And you say, well, what else have you got? And you go, nothing, come back tomorrow. That is not a joke. That is how that market is. A lot of those people are being forced into that market from buying flats from big branded property companies like Ballymore and Barclay and Red Row and da -da, 
all very, very slick, clever companies selling nice-ish properties to people, but selling them in a very particular way with a very great service. For my money, branded PRS models, branded rental, where you get a product that is designed, branded, service-oriented, service-focused, um, uh, because those people that spend that money on their phones and their cars and their holidays and their hotels, the largest amount of money that they spend every month on a product or a service is the shittest, rubbishest service, the shittest, rubbishest product. Uh, it's unbelievable, and it's got to change. We have five minutes left. I'm being waved at over there. <laughs> So branding, branded product, branded product for, and all that that means. Virgin flats, that's what we need. For, for legal purposes, I would like to point out other rubbish letting agents are available. It's not just black cats if any of their representatives are in the audience. Sorry, um, a bit of personal experience, no, I'll yeah. say. I'll add to that. Um, any, any other questions uh, at all? Lady in the, in the front row. Um, hi, I'm Jess. I'm an interior designer. Um, I just wanted to know, do you ever work with small design houses? And if so, how do we go about pitching ourselves to you? Uh, we work with almost exclusively small design houses. Um, I'm a bit scared of big com companies. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether it's just my own prejudice, but I have a feeling that big design companies are not very innovative and don't... Um, are a bit lazy I don't know um, I like working with sorry hands up who's from a big design company uh, I love working with small designers because it's uh, always exciting um, and you get personal service and I bother about that really a lot uh, send me an email um, do, do sort of small designers sort of miss any tricks that big design houses do or, or, vi or vice versa as well um, it's it's harder work working with small suppliers, and that's not that's not a that's not a bad comment. That's uh, that's what you choose to undertake when you work with smaller companies. Um, we we work with a, a an interior designer who does all our show flats. It's a very small practice. They just have four people. They're based in Clapham. Um, from them, we get the most unbelievably brilliant service. Um, but it's quite an intensively personal service. Um, it, there's not an army of people all out doing stuff and having a meeting once a month, delivering a report and an update thing. It's very six phone calls a day uh, stuff. But I like that. It just makes me feel more in control and more uh, involved in the process, and I like to be involved in the process. I think it depends hugely on who your client is. It's my job to manage those people. In other property developers that I know, it'll be the development manager's job to do that, who won't know one end of an interior designer from another, and I say, God help you in that position, I really do. Um, sometimes you would be in the marketing team, I suppose, if it was a big um, Ballymore or uh, Barclay Homes type um, scheme. Um, so I think it depends on your client and how much time they have, how much interest they have in what you do. You know, I know of some developers where the development managers couldn't care less what the show flats look like and don't want to even hear from their designers. They just want it done, finished, open on January the 1st. Don't even talk to me. Uh, others, me, I want to know. Thank you. Uh, gentleman in the centre there. Are we on? Um, architect in South West London. I uh, just want to bring you back to the planners. Um, I've got a small practice, three clients locally who have no experience of development but have the opportunities to develop 10 flats, 12 flats over shops. We're coming up against the planners all the time. You've hinted at it. Have you got any little pearls of wisdom for us? In your, um... Sorry, I didn't hear any of your questions. Can you hear that? All right, thanks. Um, architectural practice in southwest London. We've got three inexperienced developers, of small opportunities, 10 flats, over shops. As your clients? And, as clients. And their inexperience and our inexperience with the planners is obviously not bearing much fruition at the moment. We're being strictured. I've already told you it's southwest London, so you're probably guessing at who they are. Um, have you any pills of wisdom for us to, um, at that point of delivery? Yes. Uh, Thank you you will only make that work when you make the relationship with the planners good. Um, the worst issues come between developers and local authorities when the relationship between the planning officers and the developers is, is weak and non-existent. 
if those planning officers are busy and uh, disinterested, go and camp out in their office, bang their door down, demand meetings, show that you bother and care, and that they have a duty to engage with you, because it is a waste of everybody's time for you to be submitting planning applications that get turned down. There is absolutely no need whatever, I think, that if you do your work properly, for 99 out of 100 planning applications to be passed at first meeting, if you do your work well enough early on. So our schemes are hugely much larger than that. Um, and we get a lot of attention a lot quicker in local authorities because we have huge schemes. But the first thing that I do is go and call up the councillors, the planners, and I make meetings and I go and I sit with them and I say this is the start of a beautiful relationship and you're not going to see anybody else but me over the next six months and I'm going to be in your face morning, noon and night. And it just means that you solve problems before they become problems. Uh, forcing good relationships with planners, it's, it's uh, gold dust. Fantastic. I think we've probably got time for one last question if there, if there is anyone. No, well, I think in that case, then we can end on those. Oh, one guy one, one, in the red one jumper. Was just about to knock it down. Um, my name's Joseph um, Oviawe from Studio Two, small architectural interior design house. Um, you mentioned something really poignant regarding the developer's um, product and the importance of sort of branding the um, properties almost as a package, for lack of a better term. Um, how would you suggest the thing that caught us is, is very similar to what we're doing with the handful of developers we're with now. We're trying to talk them into developing themselves into a brand, um, something that will become synonymous for whatever they might be into, whether it's eco, um, high-end, whatever. How would you, are there any suggestions you could give us as to how we might convince them that that's the right way to go? I mean, perhaps other examples well, drawn to. maybe Mike would have a view on that. I mean, how many press releases do you get in your inbox every day? Two, three hundred, probably. Two or three hundred, um, they go. And how many turn themselves into news stories? Uh, we do about 20 stories a day. But out of so, those press releases, one? Yeah, maybe. Okay. So uh, you can see the uh, pig swill that's arriving in Mike's inbox every day from, uh, from everybody in our industry. If you're going to catch Mike's attention and get a story on page two of Property Week, you need to be saying something interesting that's different than, some, than everybody else in the industry. It's an absolute no-brainer. You just have to persuade them that if they want attention from the media, attention from the marketplace, they have to do something different than everybody else. That's it. They have to work out what that is from them, and it's got to be something that they are passionate about and interested in and can do. Uh, you know, I don't know how to build buildings in the Arctic, so I'm not going to do that. But uh, it's about, it's a, it's a no-brainer for me. You should say something different, do something different, do something that everybody else is not doing. And, it, you know, just to add a little bit to that, if you're looking for sort of live examples, two at totally different ends of the scale, um, Westfield, the sort of big, you know, biggest shopping centre developer in the world, why, why are they... Why have they just sort of won the battle to build a new centre in Croydon? Um, it's because the Westfield name carries so much weight. Um, I used to live in Croydon, and it's a joint venture that they're doing with Hammerson. And when the joint venture was announced, the word Hammerson wasn't anywhere on the front page of the Croydon Advertiser, but the word Westfield was, because everyone wants a Westfield in their, in their kind of town, because it's become synonymous with quality. So that's sort of one end of the scale. And then the other end is sort of fizzy living, which is a sort of um, part of Thames Valley housing. And they've created a, a lot of noise around that brand. You know, when we sat and judged our sort of property awards, the debate was, you know, is this a kind of revolutionary, you know, kind of step forward in, in branding for, for houses or is it just smoke and mirrors? Well, the fact that, you know, we were talking about it kind of means that it doesn't matter if it's smoke and mirrors. They had that brand and they'd sort of created that noise around a, around a product. So they, they would be sort of two, two examples that I would sort of point to to, to, to use as sort of live examples. Um, and, and on that, I think, I think we're well over our sort of five-minute minute time. So thank you so much to, to Martin and thank you for all, all, all your time as well.